Okay, it's um, just, just not myself. Uh, Derek Byerly was also the co-author on this. Um, so we're, uh, we're jointly responsible uh, for, for what's, in the, uh, what's in the history. Um, if, if you look at the various volumes written on the, uh, the history of the CGIAR, um, there's sort of an extensive uh, discussion of the development and formation of Erie and of Simit. And then they usually say, and then there were these other two uh, additional uh, centers, uh, IITA and SEAT, with very little to say about IITA and SEAT. So we, we, we come to the, you know, the 50th anniversary and it is a chance to actually, you know, look and develop sort of the history of, of SEAT. And uh, this is the first. The, the history of SEAT has, has, has not been, been written. And so we've, we've produced the, uh, the first and hopefully not the last of, of the histories. At, at the same time, uh, IATA, who's also celebrating their 50th anniversary, uh, Rodomiro Ortiz has produced a, a history of IITA. So at this point in time, we're, we're able to, I think, sort of complete that early history of the, uh, the formation of the, uh, of the, of the CGIAR. So we, we'll, we'll, we'll organize this by focusing, uh, first of all, sort of developing a little bit, I mean, and this is going to be, uh, it's going to be history light. Uh, the, uh, the actual volume is 140 pages, so we're, we're going to summarize this down uh, just to its, uh, its, its, its skeleton. Um, Birth of Sia uh, came, was essentially due to the, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation and, and in addition, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Ford Foundation. Uh, it started with the Rockefeller Ford and Ford Foundation developing Erie in 1963. Uh, and then a process, and, 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 and this built, and sort of the early conception as well of, of Simit, built on the quite extensive development prior to this of international sort of germaplasm flows uh, and, 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 and germaplasm testing. In, in international networks. It was these, these sort of international networks that then provided the basis for, in a sense, the concept of an international center. Uh, and you know, that then led to the development of these, these two commodity centers, uh, Erie and, 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 and Simit. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, and, and particularly in Simit, uh, Simit was essentially built on the Rockefeller Foundation's uh, Mexican Agricultural Program. Um, Rockefeller also had major programs in Colombia and also in, in, in India. Um, and the, you know, the, the concept at that particular time, and, and Phil mentioned George Harar, uh, was that these international centers would be international, but as well with a regional focus. So uh, ERI would focus on, on Asia and in a sense be embedded in the overall sort of development context of Asia, cement for, for Latin America, and sort of the, the big outlier was then, then, then Africa. Uh, so Ford Foundation had a particular interest through its investments in university education in Africa uh, to combine that with you know, uh, an international center based, based in Africa to which the Rockefeller Foundation joined. And that would set up sort of these, these regional, these international center regional poles. The, the complication sort of came in, in 1963 when the National Agricultural Sciences uh, Foundation, and this, this was building on the Alliance for Progress uh, that John Kennedy had, had set up at the time. And agriculture was a major part of that 
uh, Alliance for Progress. And as we discussed yesterday, was seen as a key vehicle for stabilizing rural security in, in, in the Latin American context. And the, uh, the, the, the NAS report essentially suggested a, a, uh, a tropical research institute to be created. And this would be funded principally by, by USAID, uh, but there was discussions at the same time with, with, with Rockefeller Foundation. Well, this created a little bit of a dilemma then for the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, who had this vision of an integrated uh, international yeah, uh, uh, system of uh, agriculture research networks. And so there was a process uh, you know, between USAID primarily and the Rockefeller Foundation as to what this, this new <laughs> uh, tropical research institute would, 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 would be. And, and to a certain extent, that led to the idea of, of, of SIAT. Uh, it was, in a sense, a reaction to the, uh, the National Academy of Sciences uh, proposal and the interactions between USAID and a high-level commission, and that high-level commission was chaired by George Harar uh, as to how this, this, this new entity would be developed. Uh, and that then sort of led to the Roberts uh, Hardin sort of proposal for, for, for SIAT. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation sort of, in a sense, gained the, the upper ground. And SIAT was then, you know, came into, you know, vision as a, a, uh, a center for research on Latin America, but particularly on the lowland tropics. So the, the development of IITA and, 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 and CIMIT were then, uh, I would say, sort of harmonized into sort of a new vision of what one of these early international centers would be. And particularly, they moved away from the commodity focus to very much of a, of a systems focus, a focus on production systems in the lowland tropics and how to increase the productivity of those, 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 those systems. And these are the, essentially the design elements of the, the Robert Hardin proposal. That was the basis then for both uh, Ford Foundation and Rockefeller Foundation initial funding of, uh, of, of, of SIAT. And you can see the focus on, on food security. Again, tropical Latin America was a net importer of food at that particular point in time. Uh, Brazil was a net importer of food at that particular point in time. So the focus was, was, was on food security and relatively high levels of malnutrition in, 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 in uh, Latin America. But with a particular focus on the agricultural frontier and particularly the savannas of the agricultural frontier. This was seen as, as in a sense, the, the real potential for increasing food production and food security in the, in, in, in the continent. And that would be based on a focus on production systems. Production systems not including crops, but as well including, including livestock. And I, I think the other key part of this was then sort of building the capacity of the, uh, the national programs. Uh, and that, that as well particularly included universities. So that over time, uh, national capacities would begin to take on in a sense, the, the, the research agendas uh, as developed within, within the International Center, uh, SEAT. I want to point out, and this, this was, was very evident yesterday in our discussions, the critical role played by, by the Colombian government, both in sort of the early development of uh, an establishment of, of, uh, of SEAT, uh, its purchase of the land here for the station, 
Uh, it's also purchase of the land in Kerry-Managua. Um, but it continued to provide uh, support to aircraft virtually through its, through its whole history. And a, and a particularly important point in, in time was in 1993 when the budget really started to decline at a time when uh, Gustavo Norris was, was trying to sort of restructure uh, the program activities. Uh, and this created major sort of organizational sort of issues within, within the center. And the Colombian government came in with a five-year convenio with support to quite a bit of uh, quite substantial uh, financial support to, to the institution. And that convenio, that five-year convenio was then, was then repeated uh, another two times. And, and again, yesterday you saw, you know, in terms of Cor Corpa Ipca, uh, now committing funds to the development of the, uh, of the German Plastic Bank. So there's been a continual both institutional interaction, but as well financial support and institutional support to, uh, to uh, SEAT in its, in its development. So I'm just going to focus on pulling out just sort of five, five themes, which, which I, I want to uh, sort of go through, just as a really sort of a, a summary of the, uh, of the, of the, of the history of the, uh, of the institution. And we'll focus first on this integration of commodity and NRM research. Uh, this is run through the, uh, the, 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 the center, and I would say also pervades discussions at the level of the CGIAR, particularly with the expansion of the CGIAR in, in 1993 uh, from essentially sort of commodity programs and ecoregional programs to include NRM uh, centers. And you know, uh, how, particularly with the, uh, the most recent reform in, in 208, how then to sort of think about an intersection between those NRM programs and those commodity and ecoregional programs. But let's focus on, 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 on SEAT. At, at you know, sort of the initial sort of implementation of the uh, of the Hart, or the Roberts Hardin uh, proposal, what we had was in a sense uh, sort of a, a dominant model in terms of how to organize agriculture research, and that model was essentially the Green Revolution model, uh, essentially based on commodities. Uh, and essentially targeted to, to more favorable areas. There was, at the time, or at least in, in sort of my reading, no experience at all in terms of thinking out to organize uh, agriculture research within a systems framework. And as well, at the same time, very little experience in terms of organizing breeding uh, for rain-fed areas, unfavorable rain-fed areas. So uh, a major issue then for you know, sort of the uh, Ulysses grant uh, in the early stages of, well, how do we build uh, and how do we design sort of around this initial template uh, as provided by the, uh, by the, uh, the Roberts Hardin uh, 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 proposal. And finally, Yes, and an, an important part, and if, if we're going to move towards systems research, and, and in part this, this was, this was the, the rationale behind the, uh, the Caramagua station, uh, a significant part of this, this, this research would have to be done on farm, but linked back to research done in the, uh, in the, uh, in, in, in the research station. So uh, within the history then of, of, of SEAT, you have two major sort of competing organizational models. Uh, the, the sort of the first and 
I would say possibly the, the, the more dominant one, uh, was the 1974-1990 period, 15 years, under one director general, uh, John Nickel, who uh, essentially said that we're going to focus on four crops, and that's beans, cassava, tropical pastures, and, 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 and rice. Uh, and we're going to do that within the context of developing interdisciplinary crop, crop research programs. And as, as, as I look around the uh, sort of the, 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 the system, and particularly the system at that time, uh, CIELT was well ahead in, in a sense, perfecting that particular model of the interdisciplinary crop research program. Uh, I think uh, most would say that those programs functioned very well. But the, the problem was those four crops uh, were in completely different agroecologies. Beans were completely out of the agroecology of, of cassava, which was out of the agroecology of, of rice, particularly irrigated rice, and which was mainly out of the agroecology of, of tropical forages, particularly for the, uh, for the savanna areas. So it, it, it ran across sort of just about all the tropical agroecologies that, that, that one can conceive of. And so there was very little potential for integration or synergies between the different crop programs. So what you had was essentially a center with four centers, <laughs> sub-centers. Uh, which called these are called I think silos uh, these 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 days. So sort of a, a complete movement then away from the whole concept of systems research and how to do systems research. And then uh, Gustavo Norris came in in uh, 1990, 91, and this was at the period of sort of real debate on the sustainability agenda, preservation of the, uh, the natural resource base, and you know, a perception by him at the time that, that funding was going to sort of shift majorly into these areas. So he completely, in his strategic plan of 1991, completely restructured the, uh, the uh, uh, program structure of, uh, of, of, of Siet, with a focus on three ecologies uh, and then integrating the crop research programs into those ecologies into a more sort of farming systems sort of modality. This, however, occurred at the time when funding was, was, was going down. Uh, and how to do this major restructuring when you had, in a sense, such sort of a dominant organizational form in terms of you know, the four commodity programs, and how to shift, in a sense, resources out of those programs and into your, your system programs. And this created for, for Gustavo a major, you know, organizational and management issue, which he, he never sort of succeeded with. But uh, continuing over that time, and when Grant sort of came in, he stuck with the 1991 uh, uh, strategy, uh, focusing on NRM and the idea of, of integrating sort of commodity research. But again, with severe sort of um, uh, financial constraints in, in order to, to really explore that, 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 that model. And I guess you could say that over the, you know, the succeeding, succeeding periods through Voss and now into to Ruben's tenure, that the focus has continued to be on, well, how does SIAT think about organizing its research sort of within a, a systems framework? And you saw a little bit of that yesterday. You saw this yesterday uh, as well in terms of the impact. 
And I think it's true to say, and the point of this is that the impact has primarily come within the commodity research programs. Very limited you know, uh, impacts in the, uh, in, the uh, in, 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 in the system's work. And now I want to turn <laughs> to a few, re a few reflections by uh, by a leader of one of those those crop research programs. <laughs> Thank you, John, for that introduction. <laughs> I, I don't leap onto the stage with quite the uh, alacrity which I did in that time. Actually, that, that photograph was taken, uh, and it's interesting from the point of view, I was actually with Omar Torrijos, um, the president of Panama, and that was just after the SEAT installations had been opened. Um, and I was sort of on the design committee for the laboratories, and I'm very proud of this photograph because it shows that the laboratories we designed um, about 45, 46 years ago um, were in fact well designed because they're still used to this day. Um, the commodity pro program approach, um, John asked me to say a few words about it. I'm actually not going to say whether we should be in the commodity programs or we should go for the other approach. I think what we should do instead is look at why they were successful. As John has said, they were very successful. Why they were successful. And if we can learn from the reasons why they were successful, how we can be successful in other areas. And I think there were some key points which came out of the, of the whole development of a commodity program um, approach. Um, first of all, um, when that photograph was taken, I was young, I was pre presumptuous. We were all a bit young and presumptuous when we came and started the commodity programs. We thought big. We wanted to change the world. This was, these were the days of Erie, the Green Revolution, and we were, in a, we were going to do as well as they'd done at Erie and that. So if you want to do something, think big, be presumptuous, be bold. I think this is one of the important things. Second, we had very, very clear objectives. Um, I mean, I heard Luis Fresco saying... Yesterday, she's a lover, lover of cassava, I was glad to hear, Luis Fresco saying to feed this world. That was what we all knew what we were doing. When I was in Uri, when I started, I mean, everybody knew what we were up to. Very, very clear objectives. Doesn't mean we knew how to get there. That's the thing. But we knew where we wanted to go. So that's one of the very important things, first of all, is to know where you want to go to. Then you need to assemble a multidisciplinary team. And I think we heard quite a lot of this yesterday when uh, people were talking, that you need to have a multidisciplinary team or people with different knowledge, people from different cultures, with people from different ideas working together in a team, but for this common objective. Fourth, this is what comes from, I think, sort of the Churchill philosophy and then was converted into the Chandler philosophy. Winston Churchill said to the Americans um, in the Second World War, give us the tools and we'll do the job. Chandler and Erie, who I had the good fortune uh, to work with, was a very junior person, but his philosophy was totally, I mean, I was a postdoc there, and he would come around to the office and ask me if I'd got, or the lab or the field, have you got everything you need? The idea was you've got this multidisciplinary team there of people who've got these clear objectives, and what the administration's got to do is keep them happy so that they can do their job. And I'm not mean just giving them everything. You've got to keep them happy. Scientists are, are a rough, funny lot of people. Um, and um, uh, so you're very difficult to keep them happy. Um, fifth, you need to take a long-term view. 
I heard yesterday one of the people talking about big data and that saying how you can have things very, very quickly uh, these days. The revolution of the tractors in Nigeria happened very, very quickly. But in agriculture, in most things, if you want to have a major change, things don't happen very, very quickly. Is Philip Pardi here um, today? But I always loved reading. Yeah, uh, Slow Magic is one of the things I recommend, if you haven't read it, for all of you to read. Um, six, um, you take this long-term view, you have clear objectives. Now, you have to be very careful on this. You can't just give this group of people a long-term view and give them lots of money and say, go ahead and you do your job, because they may not do it well. You need some control over them when they're doing it. But this control has to be very carefully done. You have to involve, and I think this is absolutely vital, you have to involve the people who are financing all of this and those people who are doing the work so that they have common objectives. I hate the word donor because actually you're not donors. They're not giving you anything. You're working together. Um, when I was leading the Sene Kanya and people said, you know, we're giving you money. I said, no, you're paying us to do a job. And so the donors, when us get into this thing, they're paying us to do a job. We're doing it all together with common objectives. And this um, allows you to develop a system which you're accountable. You have milestones on the way. You're seeing what's doing. And if you don't do a good job, then you cut the money off. That's fine. That's the way it's done in business. So this comes to the thing you've got accountability and you've got control with control by both the people who are financing it and the people who are actually doing the work because you're working towards common objectives. Now here I've started talking about accountability and things like that. Normally accountability, um, you have to stick sort of to a fix. That's what you've got to spend and that's what you spend it on and all that. You have to be flexible in this. You have to take the opportunities, the serendipity, the things which occur, which, which by chance you're lucky, you get it. And you have to learn from your failures. One of, one of the things, everybody talks about the success of a pasture program. Now, when I first came to see it, the pasture program was uh, grasses and legumes. And this was sustainable nitrogen. Well, they failed with the legumes. But they didn't give up and say, that, you know, they adapted and moved to a different way and had a successful program. So take your opportunities when they come and learn from your, um, your mistakes. Eighth, have a very clear way of how what you're doing is finally going to have an impact. In the early days of SEAD, I can always remember standing up at annual review and Ed Pulver sitting at the back there. James, where's the impact? Um, <laughs> But you must always have that idea of working on how to get the impact. And finally, and probably most important, and Bernard Ray mentioned this in his presentation, we at SEAT here, we're only doing part of it. And we must work so that the partners we have who are the people who are actually close to the rural communities, who are actually out there doing the things and making everything happen. But they have got everything that they need to do their job. If they need information, if they need training, if they need support. When IDRC originally supported the cassava program, one third of the money went to national programs and training so that one could eventually have an impact. And Colin McClung, who was deputy DG in SEAT, um, uh, when I came in, yep, okay. He said to me one time, he said, if you're going to have impact, what you've got to do is get your partners out in the countries to do their job as well. If they don't do their job, you have no chance. So one has to do everything to see the partners there. Thanks, John.
then go on to the, the next theme. Frontier development in Latin America, which was a key part of uh, the, uh, the Roberts Harden. Uh, frontier development was never 100% focus of, 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 of SEAT. And in thinking about how that particular component sort of integrated into SEAT research, there were ver various balancing points. Uh, one was focus on the savanna or extension from the savanna into the, uh, into the tropical rainforest margins and particularly rehabilitation of, of, of pastures in, 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 in those areas. Also, sort of the, the Llanos of uh, Colombia and Venezuela versus what to do in the Brazilian Cerrado. And finally, a difficulty, which I've said before, that crop choice was only partly congruent with the frontier focus. Uh, and that was obviously primarily uh, uh, forages. But uh, upland rice also came, came into that at a, at, a, at a later stage, and particularly the role of upland rice as a sort of a crop introduction in order to then lead to the sowing of, 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 of improved, improved pastures. And uh, you know, I suppose there's a, it's in any writing of history, there's a, a, a what if question. Could SEAT have just focused this research program on the Latin American frontier? And you know, in, in hindsight, I would say that probably no and particularly given sort of what happened in the Cerrado, where SEAD had some initial inputs in the development of that, that, that program, but with the expanding uh, capacity in Embrapa, Embrapa sort of took the lead and, 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 and ran with it. Within the context of very high uh, input subsidies, particularly for lime and, and fertilizer and, and infrastructure development which then led to probably the, the major you know, success in the, uh, in the uh, uh, savannas, which was the Brazilian Cerrado, and continues to, to, to this day. So it, it does raise the issue of sort of, you know, how do we view, and it, it's, it's a little bit back to, to James's point, on, you know, when, when, when do you think you know, you've invested enough and that the probability of impacts, you know, are not going to be sufficient in order to justify increased investment. And this, this was a, a, a little bit of the issue in terms of sort of the limited or lagged impact uh, of the work in tropical pastures, particularly in the Llanos, uh, and even more importantly in the pasture rehabilitation in the, uh, the, 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 the forest margins. Um, and interestingly, it sort of now continues into uh, discussions in, 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 in Africa, and particularly with, with Borlaug's, I think, promotion of the success of the Cerrado, that this can be you know, transferred to thinking about the Guinea savannas, the relatively underpopulated uh, Guinea savannas of Africa, as another breadbasket for the world. So we're talking about Latin America as a breadbasket you know, for world security yesterday. Uh, what is the potential in the Guinea savannas of Africa? Well, uh, you know, it doesn't take into account you know, the full context of what were the factors that were responsible for the success. It wasn't just technology. Uh, in fact, technology was probably one of the, uh, one of the you know, more minor elements in, 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 in that success. But, you know, the African Development Bank, and you saw Akeen Adesina yesterday, is making a major investment in the transformation of the African savanna. Uh, and, you know, with the question of does SEAT have a, a potential role sort of uh, with, within that? Uh, and what, what would that role be? And does that return us you know, to a little bit more focus on the, uh, the idea of research for frontier uh, establishment. 
The other element uh, theme, rural poverty and the small farmer. And we also discussed that yesterday. Um, and uh, this, this dates back to, you know, it's true as James said, that the original focus was on of the, of the CG uh, and you know, sort of the initial centers was on, on food security. But starting with McNamara's uh, 1973 uh, Nairobi speech, he tried to sort of shift that or add to that uh, eradication of poverty. And he set out as a goal, which I think prefigured the, uh, the, the SDGs of eliminating poverty by 2000. Well, we never quite got to there, although uh, uh, what's happening and happened in, in China sort of got us sort of a long way, sort of along that. At the same time, there was a lot of literature being generated on the second generational problems of the Green Revolution, particularly that the benefits were being directed to larger, larger farmers with more resources and away from, from smaller farmers. And particularly, and again, we discussed this yesterday, within the context of, of Latin America, the, the issue of how you think about this problem within a very skewed distribution of land. Um, and again, as Julio said, uh, even today, uh, two-thirds of the rural population you know, is under the poverty line. That was probably similar to when you know, we were operating back in the 1970s and 19, 1980s. So there, there was then, you know, uh, uh, rural poverty and the small farmer came into you know, the decision making and the priority setting uh, and the research design process of, of, of SEAT. And it, it, it started with the, uh, the small farming systems program, which was, uh, 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 essentially sort of the first, the first try at this. And the, the idea here, and it gets back to sort of the systems approach, was, was that this, this program would sit in a sense above the commodity programs as, as, as an integrator, uh, drawing on the work of the commodity programs, but feeding them into much more of a small farmer systems focus. But SEAT was not ready for that particular structure at that particular time. Uh, and John Nichol sort of closed the program in, 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 in 1975, uh, given his focus on just the four commodity programs. So uh, the last point, I mean, SEAT didn't at that stage have the, the flexible program structure sort of allowing for the interaction between the system and the commodity programs. And, and yet that is probably essential when you start to think about how, how does a, a center sort of design a commodity program, I mean a, a systems program, and, and we'll come back to that. So uh, the, the approach that SEAT then adopted to, to the small farmer was, was essentially this, that beans and cassava were essentially grown by, by small farmers and impacts we had there would be essentially directed to, to, to small farmers. A very important element was what's, what was called the minimum input technology philosophy. That in order to, for small farmers to have access to technologies, they would not be dependent on, on high levels of, 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 of inputs. And that led to a focus, particularly in the breeding program, on adaptation to more unfavorable areas, uh, edaphic constraints, and which in the end became the basis for, in a sense, the, uh, the, the approach to sustainability. All of those are needed in order to develop sustainable, sustainable systems. So it, it, it actually worked in, in, in two regards. Farming systems research came in purely focused on the commodity programs. Uh, and then the major development, which, which Jackie uh, led, the development of farmer participatory research, which came out of the, the initial or early work on farming systems research and the, uh, the CLs. 
And I, I also put in here the, uh, the cassava processing uh, cooperatives. But we'll have a few reflections then on uh, how SEAT did in terms of thinking about the small farmer in Latin America. should be green on the top. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, John, and thank you, Siat, for the invitation to uh, join Ten this wonderful minutes. celebration and also to be part of thinking about what the exciting things that are going to happen in the next 50 years. <laughs> um, you know, research at, uh, on small farms at Siat has under, undergone some enormous changes, as John has pointed out. Um, the top photo there is when I arrived as a very young and... Uh, as, as James said, thinking big postdoc uh, sociologist from Cornell. There weren't, I think, any other social scientists, sociologists that see it at the time. And the uh, then director general, who'd closed the farming systems program five years earlier, took me aside and said, you know, international agricultural research is not done on farms. And I think he was making a point there. Well, uh, in response to that, uh, the SEAT scientists, as I'm sure you'll agree is typical of them, decided to turn that conventional, then conventional wisdom on its head and uh, rebel against convention. And out of that, uh, that uh, attempt to, to do the unconventional, developed a whole suite of participatory research methods. Uh, they became uh, important, particularly in the breeding programs. And they're now part of the sort of standard toolbox of many of the uh, breeding programs throughout the, the CGCRPs. And they spilt over, as John pointed out, into uh, food systems, agroenterprise development, climate change. And they're an important part of the national programs and networks such as PABRA. So I think from just reflecting on, on that experience of, of innovation at SEAT, I would say, as, as John's book points out, see, it's always had a, a core of research around its commodities, but it's had this innovative edge as well where, where scientists were able to experiment and, and think outside the box. And it's been very important that see, it's had uh, boards and senior management and DGs who've allowed the scientists to think outside the box when it comes to small farms. So there's a... Just a couple of things that I'd like to highlight when I think towards see its future that we can draw from, from that past experience. And, and the first is Jeff referred to uh, innovation, quality, and relevance as being three watchwords. And I'm, I'm going to echo James here in saying, being bold, thinking outside the box, turning conventional wisdom on its head, uh, and keeping thinking about small farms as part of SEAT's innovative edge. I think that's going to be part of future success. The, the president said yesterday, el campo debe ser protagonista. And we should remember that small farmers, uh, indeed all farmers, are experimenters. They, they do research. They are active partners in research. And if we can build a future that... Um, with food systems or whatever the emphasis is that brings small farmers and farmer organizations in as active partners, I believe that's going to be a strong foundation for success. And you have a wonderful experience with FLA as the type of organization that's inclusive and brings small farmer research issues into partnership with the science community. Um, the second thing I think is that we've learned to, we've learned that uh, a small farm is more than a household. We've learned to unpack the concept of a farm and a farming system and to recognize that the farm and the farming system, the food system, consists of many different individuals, some of whom are men, some of whom are women. They have different interests. They have different roles, responsibilities, and rights. And that not all of the people in that farm are necessarily farming. They have many different occupations. So we need to not be careful not to get into thinking in boxes, but to, to unpack that concept of the farm. The, the small farmer on the, with the hoe on the hill uh, is very likely 
processing her cassava, uh, trading it in a dynamic local market, and she may even be spending part of her time working in a vegetable packing shed. So remembering that when we talk about farms, small farms, farm farming systems, food systems, that these consist of different people with different roles and rights and responsibilities, uh, and that that concept is central to tackling the issue of equity in food systems, I think that's an important foundation for the future. So thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks. Okay, unfortunately, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to skip, uh, skip through the, uh, the rest of this. So uh, this, this is a big issue within SEAT and its history, whether to focus globally or eco-regionally. Um, it's also a big issue within the CG, but I won't say any more about that. And let me, let me finish on this, this, this last theme then. Organizational flexibility and, and institutional change. And it, it, it also relates to the, uh, the, the systems question. In, in many ways, SEAT is lucky in, in that it probably has the broadest, most flexible mandate. It, it came before the development of the, of the CGIR, and in a sense, the attack sort of locking centers into particular, particular mandates. Uh, so it's, it's, it's been able to reinterpret its, its mandate at various points you know, in, its, in its history. And there was one in EPMR, I think in 2000, which made the point that SEAT has probably undergone more programmatic change than any other center in the, uh, in the system. And Ruben referred to that, uh, that, that, that yesterday. And, and that's due to a continuous reinterpretation of the mandate. Uh, again, this mismatch of the selection of the commodities and the, uh, the ecologies, which allowed a, a very broad focus in terms of where SEAT put its programs in, in the tropics. Uh, programmatic adaptation to, uh, to changing development agendas, and you can see this particularly uh, in terms of big data, biotechnology, uh, which feeds into the, the, ne the next point on early integration of the new science into programs. And I think John made that point yesterday in, uh, in, in his re remarks. But it is well at the same time, and, and see how it went through some very difficult sort of restructuring due to fiscal downturns. Uh, and some of this institutional flexibility was absolutely essential in allowing the system, allowing the center to, to get through those, 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 those periods. And, and finally, uh, it, it's allowed a, a significant responsiveness to the reforms in the CG. So uh, back in the period of, of system-wide programs, uh, CIET, you know, was, was what aligned or participated in more of those than any other center, and I think that as well applies to the uh, to the, C the CRPs. So uh, this this history of sort of organizational change and, and flexibility, I think, has has served it very well and continues to maintain in in the culture of the uh, of the institution. And I, I think as well, as you look across the history, you can see sort of an evolution of the research in a sense to higher system levels, starting with, you know, in, in, in essence, the crop research programs that are very much of a, of, of a plot scale, then moving to NRM and agroecologies, but looking at the farming system within those agroecologies, and then finally to uh, eco-efficient production systems, which absolutely depend on a, a systems approach. And then with the discussion yesterday, well, where do we go in the future? And does that future you know, imply some movement into food systems? Uh, and that's the question for the future and I guess the, uh, the rest of the, 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 uh, the afternoon. And, and, and finally, 
thinking about just how, you know, this continuous question of how, how, how to organize systems, systems research. And it, it, it necessarily has to be done in some type of, of matrix approach. Uh, and a matrix approach that as well allows sufficient flexibility and interaction uh, between the cells in, 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 in that matrix. So the, the current program organization of, of, of CIUT is, is this. So we have three principal programs that sort of come out of the evolution of the, you know, the uh, sort of the, the research of the, uh, of, of the center, crop improvement still, soils and land productivity, and decision and policy analysis. Those are the, those are the research programs uh, and you saw some of those, some of those yesterday's. But those are then applied to major problem areas, and major, in a sense, global agendas, preserving ecosystem services, harvesting big data, climate-proofing agriculture, making food systems sustainable. All of those sort of require different components of those programs uh, but organized in a, you know, in, in, a, in a way that then meets the challenges of those, those particular themes. How to build then sort of the, the flexibility that allows sort of the, that integration across programs or that flexibility uh, of research across programs is, I think, the, the major challenge in terms of how one thinks about uh, systems research in, in these international centers. So we'll conclude. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, when they set up SIAT and the other, other four centers 50 years ago, saw, them, saw the centers sort of working themselves sort of out of job and primarily out of a job because they saw the centers, one of the centers major sort of objectives was building the capacity of the national agriculture research systems in order to do the work that they were doing. They were in a sense a stopgap. That vision sort of hasn't been realized, partly because of still weak national programs in, in, in one regard, and in the second regard, major changes in, in a sense, the, the research agenda uh, going forward. And we, again, discussed some of that, 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 that yesterday. So I, I would conclude by saying that the, you know, the vision remains for, for SIAT. Uh, how do we explore sort of the, the new frontiers with, you know, I would say a, a very, flexible, uh, adaptable, and, you know, an internal culture that, that uh, allows SIA to sort of move forward into the future. So, thank you.